Good to see everyone this morning. What a beautiful day it is to be in the Lord's house. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here. Uh, didn't it feel good to get back to a little bit more what we just would call normalcy with with some Sunday school class, and we're going to continue uh, this format for the next couple weeks. Uh, we'll have a different teacher each week, and so uh, adults will be back in here, but we're, we're getting there, and uh, be praying that things just continue to open up and that we can come back together and, and just uh, what we consider normalcy. Uh, it depends on how you define and look at it. We can come back fully together and and worship corporately. I want to open up our worship service with these verses this morning. In Psalm chapter 33, the, the psalmist writes, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Pray or play skillfully with a loud noise. Sing unto him a new song. May we come today as we begin to worship and as we open up God's word, as we are moving back to what we are more accustomed to. Let us sing, let us take part as if it is a new song. God's word never grows old, doesn't it? It, it renews every day. Uh, we can read the same thing each and every day, and we get something new out of it, even though God's word doesn't change. And so let us sing as, as Brother Tommy leads us in worship. Let us sing as it is a new song. Our hearts are ready. Our minds are open as we encounter the living God this morning. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious, Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so glorious. Lord, you're full of love. Lord, your grace knows no bounds. Lord, and, and you, you pour blessings upon blessings upon us each and every day. Lord, your word never grows old. Lord, your word is full of power. Word changes lives. And Lord, that's why we are here this morning. We want to we want to worship you, the living God. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you uh, for his death on the cross. We thank you for the redemption that is made. And Lord, we thank you that through Jesus, no matter what this society says, no matter what is going on in this society, Lord, we have hope. And we can live with peace knowing that one day we'll be with you. And Lord, we pray this morning as we worship and as we open up your word and your word speaks to us, Lord, we pray that if there is one here that, that is, does not know your son Jesus as their personal Savior, that today, Lord, they would give their life to him. They'd make Jesus Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask that you move in this service today and that your will will be done. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you join in singing this morning? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood.
Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be back in your house this morning. God, I pray that today uh, we would all be changed. God, that, that your word would be spoken true and that we would, we would truly, Lord, just take everything from it, Lord, and go and apply this to our lives, and Lord, to, um, God, just go out and show the love of Christ to our, to our world, Lord, which is in desperate need of you. God, I thank you for my church family and for what they mean to me. I pray that uh, they would all be blessed today, as I already have. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to Ezra, the book of Ezra, chapter 1. Ezra, chapter 1. And as you're doing that, I want you to do something for me. I want you to say this phrase, it is a new day. Now, that was really monotone. I, I, I know what it is, is... Brother Scott asked me to say something in church, and I know what I was raised not to do, and I'm afraid I'm really going to get in trouble, but I promise you, no one will get in trouble, so you can relax a little bit. No one's going to pinch you on the shoulder, and I can thank Dr. James Dobson for that growing up, and how... Two of us were on one side and two of us were on the other and mom could always reach. And, and if we said anything, oh, it was worse. No one's going to pinch. No one's going to take you out. But to say it again, not just monotone, but that just as if you really believe it, it is a new day. There we go. We're getting better. And now here's what I want you to do. I want you to, we're going to repeat that uh, here in a little bit. But listen, it, is, it was back in March when we last were able to meet for Sunday school. And we're able to meet somewhat today. Guess what? It is a new day. We are slowly getting back to normal. And you can say it's exciting. How many are, have gotten tired of just sitting at home? How many are excited to get out and see people? Hey, we got some hands raising. That's okay. No, it, we're getting out. We're meeting people. It is a what? It is a new day. Listen, when, when the lost are found it is what it is a new day when the broken are repaired guess what when the captives are freed it is what it is a new day life has, is given and my friends we get to worship the one who is responsible for allowing and making those things happen. And for us, it is a new day. We look around, let's be honest, how many are discouraged about what they see on the news? Well, some will maybe, some will say, no, I've just turned off the news. It, it's been depressing. We look and we see, and, and what we think of, of this, where we are seeing things and, and experience things that maybe we had never, ever dreamed we'd even think of in our lives. We're, we just see, we're seeing just plain craziness. We're seeing wickedness take part. We're seeing anarchy take place. And to be honest, if we allow it, it's enough to, to get us down where we don't want to do a thing. 
We want to lock our doors. We want to turn off the lights. Hope, hopefully no one notices we're home. And just pray that God just come back real quick. Just get me out of this mess. I don't know about you, but it's easy to feel like we're captives. It's easy to, to get discouraged when we, we look around and, and it seems like God is just stamped out of everything. The days that God's word was respected because it was God's word, they're gone. The days of respecting someone even if you disagreed with them you respect them because they had a title they had uh a, that that seems to be gone and what we see uh, all around us folks is is whatever we please and listen it's nothing more than humanism whatever it pleases me whatever makes me feel good i'm going to do it and i'm not going to let anybody else tell me and we see that all, all around and and if you believe the news and and and, and the the things that are that are shared on, on different sides of the aisle per se it's hard sometimes you, you have a group that has one slant, you have a group that has another slant, and then we find ourselves, which one do we believe? And, and, and it is enough to make our heads spin. And, and as believers, let's just be honest, it's easy to think, is there any hope? Let me tell you, it is a new day. Let me hear it again. It is a new day. Why do I say that? Because God's word says that. It's not just a, a, a frilly, nice little phrase that we can chant. And oh, Brother Scott said we can talk in church. No, it, it, it is a new day because God's word says it is. And as believers, we can get rid of the discouragement. We can get rid of the fear and we can go out into this life really believing and knowing that it is a good new day because God is involved. And what I want us to look at starting this morning is a new series from rubble to return. Let's be honest, we look at our lives and the, and the society that we're living in right now, it feels like rubble. It looks like rubble. Just turn on the TV and it seems like eh, things are being burned down, things are being destroyed uh, just because I feel like it. Sometimes I wonder, where are these parents? Have you noticed some of the craziness going on and, and the age? And you know, some aren't doing it because they're smart. Because if they're smart, they would be home. And, 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 and I'm thinking to myself, where are the parents in all this? I mean, I, I'd be like the one lady I saw on the news, and, and I'm, I'm putting my, my kids on notice. I think it was when Baltimore a few years ago was having uh, the riots and, and, and the craziness going on. There, there's a kid out there messing around and in the part of it, and there's his mom and, and, and the news. I mean, they, they video, they had, saw her stomping across and finding him and grabbing his ear and twisting it and sending him home. My kids know. They're looking at me now. They're laughing. They, they get out there busting windows and all that. Mom or a daddy, whoever can get there first, is going to grab their ear and they're going to go home. And they're going to have to wait to see what happens when they get home. But we see all that and we wonder, where, where is 
the parents? Where is, where is the leadership? And, and we see just destruction going on. I want us to, to look at this, this thought from rubble to return as we, as we take a journey through uh, the book of Ezra and, and to get an idea of, of what we're looking at. This whole book of Ezra is God, Yahweh's faithfulness and, and emphasizes the loyalty he rightfully deserves. And, and, and it's a fulfillment uh, of Jeremiah's prophecy. After 70 years of exile, first in Babylon, then in Persia, the Jewish people returned to the homeland. Imagine, try to imagine what being a Jew during that time and the love for your home, the love for the temple. And the whole point of the temple was that was what God's presence. When you've been in exile, and to be honest, it feels like you're in rubble. It feel this isn't your home. Imagine being one of the Jews that was had been in Jerusalem had been in Judah, and had been taken into exile. You remember what it used to be like. And now you're experiencing something that, that isn't home. You used to go to the temple to sacrifice, and, and, and the, the high priest would go and, and, and on behalf go, go into the Holy of Holies for you and, and to God's presence and, and now you're in a place that has no regard for God whatsoever boy it's very easy if you look at Ezra it almost feels like as believers we're in exile Jeremiah prophesied that they would return and three different groups head back from exile. Can you imagine the excitement? Three groups head back in exile, from exile to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the walls, to restore worship. They didn't all leave at once. They left in waves. Ezra being one of them. We know Zerubbabel is one that led and, and helped build the temple. We know Jer or Nehemiah came along and, and helped build the, uh, the, the wall. Can you imagine? It, not just the excitement, but what came from rubble. And when they returned, and what was able to start back, there is a revival that took place. Worship was renewed. There is a new day that happened. There wasn't, there wasn't bondage anymore, or exile anymore, but they were back at the place where God wanted them. And I want us to look at this morning, Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and, and put it also in writing. He didn't just say it, but he put it in writing. Thus says uh, Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build a house of the Lord God of Israel. For he is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place 
Help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. It's interesting to note that in second, the end of Second Chronicles chapter 36, almost the exact same words are mentioned in verses uh, 22 and, and 23. The word of the Lord which was spoken by Jeremiah comes to Cyrus. And in Cyrus, God moves. Some 23 times in Scripture, we read about Cyrus, the great Persian uh, ruler who conquered the Babylonian Empire. It's interesting that in 1879, in Mosul, which we know is Babylon, what they call the, the Cyrus Cylinder, was found located in a museum in london but on this 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 clay barrel the this cylinder is the actual account of cyrus con conquest of babylon in 539 bc i find it amazing at every time we have a world that says God's word, you can't trust God's word, that, that what you find in God's word is a, is a myth. It's old uh, tales that, that, that people that make good stories, but I, I find it amazing and get excited when you read something in God's word and God says, you know what, I also want to show what a, man, a man-made thing, and, and, and I want, I'm going to connect it. And we have that instance here where we read about it in God's Word, but man has in their possession exactly what God's Word says. And then you have the, this, this cylinder that talks about Cyrus coming in some 23 times. Isaiah chapter 44 talks about Cyrus in verse 20. Thus saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all of my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt uh, be built, and, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. And going on in Isaiah chapter 45, thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I hold, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him uh, two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass cut in sunder the, the bars of iron I will give thee the treasures of darkness hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I the Lord which shall call thee by thy name am the God of Israel for Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect I have even called thee by name I have surnamed thee though thou hast not known me i am the lord and there is none else there is no god beside me i gird thee thou hast not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me i am the lord and there is none else i form the light and create darkness i make peace and create evil i am the lord do all things you know what's so amazing is that God led Isaiah to write this some 175 years before Cyrus was on the scene, before the exiles were allowed to go back to Jerusalem to, to reestablish worship to the one true uh, God, to, to build up the temple, to build up the walls. 175 years before God leads Isaiah to write this. I'm going to use Cyrus to fulfill and do my will, even though he does not know me. Returning from rubble, or going from rubble to return. And this morning, this thought of it is a new day. I want us to think of this first, God's 
sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Possessing supreme or ultimate power. We turn on the TV, we start getting worried. We turn on the TV, we get depressed, we get discouraged. We get online and read all the accounts and we're like, we're scratching our head. What do you think God's doing? You ever think about that way? We look at, oh my, uh, this world is going down the toilet. Oh my, I don't know what we're going to do. And we allow all of these thoughts to to get us down and and to press us, to slow us down from from doing what God wants us to do. And I wonder what God is thinking. We see here from the very beginning, look at this. Verse 1, thus saith the Lord to Cyrus. It is a new day when God speaks. Think about that. When God speaks, it is a new day. A God can speak to whoever he wants. But we have God's word right here. When we open up God's word and allow God's word to speak to us, it is a new day. We want to look over here and we get discouraged by what we see. We open up God's Word and allow God's Word to speak to us. It is a new day. It's amazing how God's Word can chase away discouragement. God's Word can get rid of depression. God's Word can, can place us on, on, on solid ground. God's Word can, can energize us. And no matter what happens in this world, no matter what what leader is in place, no matter what group of people say they're going to do or or don't do, God is still in control and you and I are not. I like the story of a little boy. He rushed home to his grandma's house eager to, to tell her about everything. He told her about the scrambled eggs at breakfast. And he, and, he, and he told her and just trying to describe the, the color of the sky. And he told his grandma how dad drove too fast to church, at least according to mama. And how the wind blew some paper across the street and, 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 and the paper floated into the sky. And, and grandma, as you can imagine, that, that grandchild and how descriptive they can be and, and how energetic they can be in, in telling these stories. And she stopped them and, and said, what did you learn in Sunday school? Grandma asked. Boy's eyes opened wide open. And his voice became hushed. And with being solemn and slowness, he said, we learned about God. And then in a rush of excitement and conviction, he blurted, and we learned that he's very great. And you know what else, Grandma? What she said. I'm not him. How unfortunate we often take a lifetime to learn that truth, if ever. That God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. And we're not. God said to Cyrus, And God moved Cyrus all through Scripture. We we see uh, and we read about, we're told about God's God's being all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere. That he holds everything in his hands. Job, in Job 40, says, Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency. 
and array thyself with glory and, and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold, everyone that is proud and abase him. Look on everyone that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. Is there an arm like God who can speak with the thunder like his voice? The whole chapter of Psalm 139 we see of God's sovereignty and power. Through it we see Thou knowest my sitting down, the psalmist writes, and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down. Thou art acquainted with all of my ways. The psalmist writes, where, where shall I go from thy spirit? Where can I flee from thy presence if I send up into heaven? You're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, guess what? You're there. Even now there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall, shall hold me. The psalmist says, how precious are these thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And he ends chapter 139 with, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Why can the psalmist say that? Because God is in control of everything. When God speaks, things happen. Have you noticed that? All through Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, when God speaks, what happens? Everything. Everything that we think stops and, and things happen when God speaks. Jeremiah writes in 23, 24, I am a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God far off. Can any hide himself in the secret places that, that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and fill earth, saith the Lord. Listen, throughout all of God's word, we see this, this thought over and over, God's power, God's knowledge, God's control over everything. He is a God that knows, and he is a God that can. Grab hold of that this morning, that he is a God that knows, and he is a God that hands, and he is a God that will. God knows when, and God knows where, and God knows how everything before anything will happen, God works in spite of what people do and what people believe. Even when Adam and Eve sinned, guess what? God was at work. When wickedness reigned on the earth, God was at work, working through Noah. Even though Abraham started off as a pagan worshiper, God's plan was still in play. When he chose Abraham to be the father of his people. In spite of troubles, God worked through Isaac and Jacob. We see God's sovereignty in the life of Joseph to his brothers. What you meant for bad, God meant it for good. When he was in the pit, what does scripture say? God was with him. In bondage for 400 years, God was still working, never forgetting his promises. He used Moses. He used Pharaoh that refused to acknowledge that there was one, only one true God. God was still working through Joshua, through David, through the rest of the kings, when you read about the kings of Israel and Judah, what is a common phrase that you read about many? Well, for all of them in, in Israel, they did evil just like their fathers. And guess what? God was still at work. God still had everything in control.
when God's people rejected God as the one true God, God sent them into exile as servants, first to Babylon, then to Persia. And even though they had been in exile for turning their backs on God, God never turned their backs on him, or God never turned his back on them. God was still working. God was, was still in control. God was still remembering his promises. It wasn't Babylon and it wasn't Persia. It was God in control, demonstrating his power the whole time. And the whole purpose was to send them to, into, into exile so that they would realize what they were missing, so that God could bring them. God had already promised that there would be a Messiah that would come through his chosen people. God is sovereign because God keeps his word. God was going to bring them back. There was a plan to reestablish. Yes, the temple was destroyed. Yes, the, the walls were, were, were torn down. But God already knew that, and God already had a plan to bring them back. And God spoke to Cyrus. Listen. I don't know where you are at personally this morning. But let me promise you something. God hasn't, pro hasn't forgotten you. God has not forgotten. God is fulfilling his purpose in your life. And not only has he not forgotten you, but he is working in you to fulfill that purpose. So where you find yourself right now and, and the things that, that you may be dealing with, contemplating on, God is at work. Why? Because God's word says, shows us that he is in control. And he will speak to you. He will speak to whoever he chooses to fulfill his purpose. And see, to live willingly beneath the sovereignty of God is to simply submit to the, the fact that he is in control. See, we can sit and we can dwell on what the world is doing right now. We can look at our nation. We can see the, the, the anarchy. We can see the, the disregard uh, for authority. We can see the, just the evilness. But we can delight that God is supreme. And we can live in the wonder of his grace. You see, if God was not free to do what he pleased, we wouldn't experience redemption. See, God's sovereignty allows God to display his goodness and his kindness and his faithfulness and his compassion and his forgiveness and his love. You see, without God's sovereignty, there, man has no hope. We want to look at, the, look at the world and get discouraged. Think about this. You know what's discouraging is to think if there was no hope whatsoever, that will discourage you. But we... With God's sovereignty, our hope is in him that he is all-powerful, that he is the supreme, that he rises up leaders, he takes down leaders. No matter what is going on in this world, it is not done without his knowledge. And it is a new day, no matter what we see on TV, no matter what we're told, it is a new day because God is in control. He is in control of our lives. And we see here in this first part of Ezra uh, from, from rubble, from being exiled, and, and to return to a, a place where, where they worship is established, where let's just say revival can take place. Revival happens when we realize that God is in control. But I want us to see something else besides just God's sovereignty is God's stirring. He, he, taught, he speaks to to, to Cyrus but not only that here is a as Isaiah wrote a man that did not know God 
God spoke to him, but God also stirred in his heart. It wasn't because Cyrus was a nice guy, and, and Cyrus may think that, oh, I'm going to send, send back people that were in exile to their homelands just to keep the peace. And really, that's what history says. Cyrus was known to, when he would conquer lands, and he would send back exiles to their homeland. Tell them to, to go worship your God, and in doing so, say a prayer to your God on behalf of me. See, Cyrus had this, this, he had this idea that, hey, I can make people happy. I can keep down conflict. I send, let some go home, let them build whatever, and in turn have them pray. And, you know, maybe one of those prayers catches, and it'll benefit me. See, but God was working. Cyrus thinks it's all about him. God was already working. And it says that God stirred in Cyrus's heart. Those of you from Judah that want to go back, go back. Those that want to stay, you stay. But give towards the work. There were those that did not want to leave exile. They were given the choice and they said, we wanted to stay here. Listen, you know what is needed today is a stirring of God. You want to see a revival? You want to see a new, new day take place in the Lord's churches? You want to see a new day take place in society? We need a stirring from God. God is in control, but we need God to stir the hearts of his people. There needs one today. There needs to be a movement of God. We can no longer sit on the sidelines and take in what is going around us and think everything is okay. I'm just going to wait it out. I look around and I I see what's going on. And I truly believe that God is stirring for a movement of God. People are in place, have been placed in places that Let's be honest. If you go by society, stand, they should not be in place. They don't run with, the, with the, the normal crowds. But God is doing something. God is preparing. Uh, when we look out and we, and we see the chaos going on and people talking about we need hope, and we need peace. Listen, there is a stirring, I believe, taking place for a new day to happen where people will get to a point and we can share where the true hope and the true peace is available. God is stirring. We're in a time like never before. There's never been a more needed time for the gospel There has never been a time of more searching for answers. You see, society talks about reconciliation. Our friends, Jesus has already taken care of that. Society talks about hope. Jesus has already taken care of that. Society talks about needed peace. Guess what? Jesus has already taken care of it. Society talks about love. My friends, Jesus has already shown it. Society talks about healing. My friends, Jesus has provided healing. Listen, you cannot get excited about Jesus' return and be satisfied with what's going on around us. That is nothing more than apathy. God stirs because there is a work to be done. My friends, Jesus Christ has not come back yet. Amen? I hope we say amen because we're in trouble because I'm going to say we'd all say we've put our faith and trust in Jesus and if Jesus come back, we're in some trouble. But based on God's word, Jesus has not come back. In that case, there is still work to do for the kingdom. We can't sit back and say, oh my, how horrible this thing, these things are happening, and think, oh, I'm just going to hold on tight and wait for Jesus to come back and not give a care for those out in the world.
our heart's drive, no matter who it may be, our heart's drive should be that Jesus would come into lives, change them, turn everything upside down for his honor and for his glory. You know, I heard someone talk about the, the policeman that was up in, in Minnesota that is responsible for George Floyd's death. What would happen if he was in a jail cell right now? What would happen if he knelt down in that, that cold, dark jail cell? The world, and, and realize, you know, I... You know what would happen? Jesus would care less about society. He would invade his heart. And he would be redeemed. We have a tendency to think of the worst of people. And what's so amazing about Jesus is he thinks the best. So we don't need to think of, look at chaos but what the new creation would look like in the lives of those that Jesus invades see that that's the stirring that needs to happen in the Lord's churches God is not done and if God is not done my friends listen every day is a new day a new day to be used by God. In Haggai chapter 1 and verse 14, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, and the high priest and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did a work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. God stirred people, it worked. In Acts we read, in Acts 17, 16, now Paul, while he waited for the, in, in Athens, as he looked around the city, it wasn't a pretty city. It wasn't a, a nice thing. It was a city wholly given to idolatry, the book of Acts says. What happened? It says that Paul's heart was stirred. Did he stand there and think, hmm? Well, that's a weird feeling. Did he stand there and think, man, those Athenians, they, they get what they deserve. No, his heart was stirred by what was going on around, and he went and preached Jesus. We need a stirring of the heart today. You know what stops stirring? Quenching. Paul wrote in, in 1 Thessalonians, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And quench not the Spirit. Folks, we've experienced a shutdown to normalcy that we had become accustomed to. We have watched and seen lives be taken. We, we look and we see families hurting. We watch chaos all around us. We hear of groups that we think that, you know, groups that, that don't want any rules. And, and we sit back, that is not possible. Anybody in the right mind knows you have to have rules. You have to have leadership. But we, but we see this, and, it's, and it seems like the voice is getting louder and louder. Not only no rules, but, but everything free for everyone. We see a nation that seems to be slipping farther and farther away from God. We see hypocrisy in politics. But my friends, God is still on the throne. We can choose to say, you know what? Man, it ain't worth it. 
Nothing good is going to happen. Or we're going to say, you know what? God is still on the throne. If God is on the throne, God has the power. He's still working. God is using people to fulfill his will. God is stirring the hearts of his people. Let me ask you this morning, will you be like the exile? They were given a choice. Cyrus says, uh, I'm going to send you back. Who, want, who wants to go? There's a girl. Oh, yeah, I want to go back to the homeland. I want to do whatever. He says, go. There are those that don't want to stay, but he's, he, didn't, he didn't give them an excuse. He says, okay, if you're not going to go, you can give to us. I don't know about you. I'd mo- probably much rather go and do the work than to have to sit and give. But he gave two, two choices. What would you do this morning? Are you satisfied in the rubble that we see all around? Or do you want to return to the glory of God? God is in control. Will you allow him to stir in your heart? What do you want you to do this morning? Let's pray. Almost gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for the many blessings. Lord, we thank you that you are on the throne, that you are almighty, you are all-powerful. Lord, that nothing happens without your say. Lord, I ask that you work in and through us. Oh, I pray and ask that, Lord, we would see a revival break out of your people. Lord, that you would strengthen your churches that we take the great commission and go like never before the fields are ripe unto harvest move in such a way that that can happen Lord I pray that you move in the hearts of the people that are here today and your will be done it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray amen I'm going to ask you to please stand as we prepare for a song of response How will you respond?